All right, everyone. So welcome back after the, the short break. And um, let me, uh, like we have only one class this week uh, in which we will return on to uh, psychoanalysis uh, to read a uh, film, right? So you have two readings for today. You had um, the second Man Mansfield chapter on uh, Jacques Lacan and then the Laura Malvi's uh, essay. So just, I will go back quickly to Freud and Lacan because this is useful for our uh, analysis. As we've seen for Freud, the other is essential to the constitution of sexual identity and the subject in particular through the Oedipus complex. And uh, uh, for Lacan too, the subject uh, is unable to define itself uh, for itself. Rather, the subject is always defined from without in the sense uh, uh, Lacan says that the subject is the discourse of um, the other. Why does he say that is the discourse, uh, the subject is the discourse of the other? Because um, Lacan combines uh, Sassur, uh, in particular um, Sassoon, Sassur's notion that language itself is other uh, to, the, to the individual as a system of conventions uh, with Freud. So for uh, Lacan, it's language rather than biological differences that uh, structures subjectivity. And uh, we've already seen this, but the central concept of uh, Lacan is the one of the mirror stage. He argues that toddlers acquire a sense of self after they recognize themselves in the mirror, and the mirror allows them to see themselves as uh, uh, one rather than to, exp than to experience their body as uh, fragmentary. And so um, the problem is that this uh, imaginary wholeness that the child uh, perceives is always uh, precarious and unstable, unstable because it is predicated upon a mere image that is reflected by a mirror. So the mirror stage is fundamentally narcissistic and ends partial and incomplete. Uh, if that is true, however, then it needs to be filled in uh, through imagination. And this imagination is, for Lacan, a fantasy construction, a self-gratifying image through which the individual sees herself as perfect. And this uh, kind of originary image of uh, perfection, of imaginary wholeness, keeps accompanying the subject throughout her existence. And there is always this longing for returning uh, um, in ourselves that is buried deep in ourselves to that uh, original perfection. So for Lacan, desire points to a fundamental lock in this um, structure of the subject that uh, we try to appease this sense of lack through temporary gratifications and demands that we impose on ourselves uh, through, you know, consumerism, uh, sexual satisfactions, careerism, etc. Uh, by contrast, uh, the ego, the ego ideal uh, pertains for Lacan to how the subject sees himself not from within as a, um, an imaginary projection of his own self, but from without, that is from an ideal point of view, which he calls the big other, that is external to himself. Uh, so uh, this uh, ego ideal or symbolic identification um, pertains, is made possible uh, by how the big other sees us, uh, judging us and pushing us to give our best to satisfy his injunctions. And so uh, society with a capital S or a God, right, may be uh, a kind of perfect uh, images of the big other. And the big other, uh, you might think about the function uh, of uh, religion, for example, gives us meaning, the structures, uh, what Lacan calls the symbolic order, which coincides with the law, the master signifier, the name of the father, that is the set of symbolic restrictions that ultimately give meaning to our existence in the same way as the system of conventions of language gives meaning to every single word 
that is placed uh, within this system of conventions. Um, so, Laura Maldi uh, applies um, uh, Lacanian concepts uh, uh, to film analysis in this classical, uh, classic essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema from 1975, which you might have read uh, for other uh, classes. Uh, she uh, writes that the male director is ultimately the one, uh, the film director, who controls uh, the gates, and this uh, gates is uh, inherently a, an erotic uh, look. And uh, within the movies, the male hero who moves the action forward, and um, the male hero is the counterpart to the spectator, and therefore the ideal ego of the spectator who identifies with it. And this is an image uh, and a, a screenshot from a uh, rear uh, window, which has been described itself as a, a metaphor for uh, the cinematic uh, experience. Uh, the woman, by contrast in uh, Malby's analysis, is a screen for the male fantasies. And uh, the function of women, says Malby, especially in classic uh, Hollywood uh, narrative uh, cinema, is um, always twofold. Either She's a source of anxiety uh, um, that needs to be investigated, punished, and uh, forgiven, as in the case of um, Kim Novak in uh, Vertigo. Um, if you remember, Scotty in Vertigo is uh, a policeman who is obsessed with this woman who has to find um, the truth about this woman and to find out what is whether she really is the... Uh, the look-alike, or in a certain sense, the reincarnation of the woman uh, he used uh, to love. And um, on the other hand, um, the woman uh, can be idealized and fetishized, turned into an image of uh, absolute beauty, as in the case of, say, Marilyn Monroe or many um, uh, women uh, Hollywood stars, right? And this kind of fetishization, however, says Malby, is inherently threatening uh, because it constantly threatens to arrest the flow of action and the unity of the narrative. So I'm going to play here a, um, an excerpt from uh, The Matrix, which we have watched at the beginning of the semester. Matrix is a system, Neo. That system is our enemy. When you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system, that they will fight to protect it. Were you listening to me, Neo? Or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? I was... Look again. Who is it? This isn't the Matrix anymore. It's another training program designed to teach you one thing. You are not one of us, you are one of them. So, as you can see, uh, the Wachowski siblings have obviously read not only their Potter Yard, their simulacrum simulation, but also their uh, Laura Maldi, right? Like, this is a moment in which the woman in the red dress is really able to catalyze the attention of the male hero and to arrest the flow of action to the point that the unity of the narrative that we are experiencing is itself threatened. To conclude, uh, Maldi writes that there are um, three points of view in each movie. There is the point of view of the camera, the point of view of the audience, and the point of view of the acting characters. However, uh, the conventions of narrative cinema obliterate the point of view of the camera. Uh, the actors, as we know, can never look into the camera, that's a basic uh, convention of narrative film. Uh, the point of view of the audience uh, is also 
uh, these guys and the only one that is made visible to us is the point of view of the acting characters with whom we are supposed to identify. However, she says there is a paradox in this kind of cinema because the male gaze, which is ultimately an all controlling uh, gaze, be it um, the gaze of the film director or of the uh, male hero, is constantly threatened by the female character uh, who acts in Freudian terms as a castration threat. So um, I have only one question for you this week and is how can the notions of imaginary identification, narcissistic identification or ideal ego and by contrast symbolic identification or ego ideal as articulated by Jacques Lacan be applied to an interpretive reading of the characters and um, scenes that um, the social scene that it appears in Paris is burning. Thank you very much.